to fly a UFO. I should say cosmos section come oscillate through the space-time continuum to the next dimensions with us an essential guide to all things weird and out of this world to fly a ufo quote i have an obligation to inform the public and once that's done i've done my job end quote Navy whistleblower William Cooper at a 1989 UFO conference. UFO sightings have been a consistently observed phenomenon for at least the last seven decades, continuing the pattern of such reports depicted throughout history. Anomalous aerial sightings have been reported by witnesses and recorded as artwork for thousands of years. Even cave drawings that date long before Christ depict alien-like figures and flying objects in the sky. Interestingly, the vast number of alien figures and flying disc crafts which have appeared all around the world are similar in appearance. In the modern age, humans went from Kitty Hawk to the moon in 66 years, an amazing advance. However, our current space achievements from the first moonwalk in 1969 to the present secret space program advancements will be considered a far more remarkable technology jump once the truth is known. Most UFO sightings in the last 70 years are described as flying saucers. However, these ships don't fly, they oscillate between the dimensions. UFOs were first referred to as identified alien craft, that's IAC by the military, before any backward engineering began. The military now calls UFOs alien visitation crafts or AVCs for short, as opposed to ARVs, alien reproduction vehicles, which are human constructed advanced anti gravity craft. Since it would be difficult for anyone without a trained eye to know the difference, it's easier to continue calling any unknown flying objects by their common name, UFOs. The consciousness that operates all the various UFO crafts is of the same energetic force within the crafts themselves. In other words, a fourth dimensional being will interact and navigate a fourth dimensional craft. And the same can be said for the more etheric fifth dimensional beings and the vehicles they would use. A resonant frequency or a common vibration connects machine and passenger within their co-conscious spaceship. For us earthly third dimensional human beings, we will best relate to third dimensional spacecraft. Because of the current state on this planet, Third dimensional crafts can be operated by fear-based or darker energy entities. However, there are other very human-like beings in the universe that are called fourth dimensional. These fourth dimensional humans will be able to discern crafts at their level of light and consistent with their purpose. In other words, the more highly evolved the being, the higher they will connect with the higher levels of spacecraft and therefore receive higher levels of information. Vril energy. A few years after the First World War, the ultra-secret German Vril Society was formed to study the uses of Vril energy or zero-point energy and other 
speculative free energy designs. Vril is the German term meaning, quote, cosmic basic energy, end quote. The Vril Society also took up the study of ancient Indian texts describing the Vimana flying craft. Using information from psychic mediums, ancient text scholars and archaeological digs, the pre-Nazi Germans called this research, quote, psychophysical technology, end quote. The Vril Society was known to investigate the physical properties of space and time. The Germans pushed the psychic envelope and got what they wished for over a decade before the Nazis ascended to power. The Vril Society wished to create a utopian new world based on alternative science. It is the first known modern organization to make contact with ETs via psychic mediums and channeling with the intention of acquiring advanced technology. During one such event in 1919 at an old hunting lodge in the German Alps town of Birch's Garden, the mediums Sigrun and Maria Orsic made contact with the civilization through their equivalent of mediums in the Aldebaran star system, 69 light years away in the constellation Taurus. The benevolent and highly advanced Aldebaran mediums reasoned that the suffering and inequalities of humans could benefit if they were given advanced technology. As a result, Maria Orsic was able to telepathically channel the plans for free energy devices and an advanced hyperdimensional craft. A related organization, the Thule Society, began around the same time as the Vril Society when Karl Haushofer founded the Brunder de Lix, the Brothers of the Light, in December 1919. The Vril Society is sometimes referred to as the Luminous Lodge and was eventually renamed the Vril Gesselschaft as it rose in prominence. Whereas the Thule Society focused primarily on materialistic and political agendas, the Vril Society put its attention on, quote, the other side, end quote. The predecessors to the Vril and Thule societies was the Ananurbe, or translated Legacy of the Ancestors. Founded in 1935, the Ananurbe Society was the most mysterious organization within the Third Reich. This was the only known historical structure engaged in the study of the occult and mysticism to have state funding and support. Some researchers believe that Nazi scientists were also preparing the first atomic blast, but the Cold War, or but the war, ended before they succeeded. The subsequent series of nuclear tests by other countries also initiated the, quote, Vril reaction, end quote which is the driving together or collision of positive and negative charges to the annihilation of both. An electron driven into a proton will produce an overloaded neutron, which will shatter into a long series of violently unstable mesons until the whole is converted into energy. This highly intensified energy, or the majority of the quanta, then are more than sufficient to drive more electrons into protons, and so on, through multiple increasingly powerful reactions. Furthermore, scientists did not know at one point the reaction would spread to matter 
other than hydrogen. When the Nazis obtained these plans, they used them to create wonder weapons that frightened the Allies at the end of World War II. The V-2 rocket and the first jet airplanes made a showing during the waning months of the war, but these new aircraft could not stop the Allies from advancing into the fatherland. Nazi UFOs. Nazi scientists were the first modern humans to experiment with back, backward engineering and its various strategies to achieve anti-gravity flight. In 1938, at the invitation of Benito Mussolini, German scientists were allowed to examine the remains of a UFO that was recovered in 1933 near the small town of Maderno in the Lombardy region of northern Italy. Their strategy was to combine the recovered disc designs with their Vril and Thule technology in an attempt to design their own craft. The best example of these kinds of experiments was the top secret and highly sensitive scientific technological device called Die Glock or the Bell. The bell was incorporated into a flying disc called the V-5 craft. Rare photos show the disc flying near the secret Nazi engineering division of the Skoda Works in Pilsen, Czechoslovakia. The bell had a complex system of opposing turbines purported to generate a field of anti-gravity so powerful it wreaked havoc on all life in its vicinity and may have even teleported matter over vast distances. Einstein's gravitational theorems reveal the potential for the generation of an anti-gravitational field when the equation begets a negative number. Sustaining such a system requires a continued energy input of at least 900 kilo amperes or the transfer of 1,020 electrons per second, a huge technological jump. The bell also would have acted as a time machine, that is, if such applications were desired. According to Nazi scientist Dr. Dr. Herman Obereth, quote, behavior of the UFOs discounts any means of propulsion and the principle of an anti-gravity device might be expected, end quote. One smaller model of craft designed by the Nazis was called the Vril, using principles of Vril energy as described above. A prototype of the Vril disc with an engine designed by Victor Schauenberger took flight in 1939. The Vril was small enough to fit within a larger craft designed as a cigar-shaped craft, which contained extremely advanced aerodynamic and propulsion systems. It is not known if either of these crafts ever flew into the upper atmosphere or beyond. USA picks up the scent. Early saucer recovery in the USA began in the 1940s and 1950s. The downed crafts that were observed contained basketball-sized chain reactor generators some of which were used water as fuel. This reactor created free energy and propelled the anti-gravity system to make the craft fly. At the time, and to most of the public today, this represents technology beyond our wildest dreams. This information is slowly making its way out to the public. In recent years, both NASA and the European Space Agency, the ESA, have acknowledged achieving 
anti-gravity and artificial gravity technologies. One would expect them to say the opposite if they had not reached those objectives. Whistleblowers coming from the U.S. military, such as Naval Intelligence Officer and UFO researcher William Cooper, say that some of the crafts they have seen are as large as an aircraft carrier. Such a craft is able to force ocean water to part before impact, utilizing some force field far beyond what is currently known. Quote, the crafts are real, confessed William Cooper before he was murdered by police at his home in 2001. Quote, the only question is, he added, are ETs real, end quote. Cooper always stressed that the important point to remember is that these sightings occurred, not how many, what variety of craft or where, but that they occurred. Many of the scientific principles of UFO propulsion dynamics are already known and recognized by today's physicists and have been known for some time. Life magazine featured a story in 1952 which reported that craft can fly up to 7,000 miles per hour. No power plant on Earth can account for the performance of these devices. Soviet Air Force admits UFOs are real. In March 1990, the Russian General Igor Maltsev, Chief of Staff of the Soviet Air Defense Forces, made the following statement, quote, skeptics and believers both can take this as an official confirmation of the existence of UFOs, end quote. This was at a time of rare outspokenness among military brass, only a year before the dissolution of the Soviet Union. General Ivan Tretyak, who was then the Soviet Deputy Minister of Defense, as well as Commander-in-Chief of the Air Defense Forces, confirmed this position. In regard to the validity of these statements from the highest ranking officers in the Soviet Air Force, there would be no reason to think that what they were saying was a hoax. Instead, they were reflecting glasnost, the policy of a maximal publicity, openness, and transparency in the activities of all government institutions in the Soviet Union. In addition, both Tretyak and Maltsev took care to note that the vast majority of cases are either misidentification of natural phenomenon or hoaxes. When asked about his personal interest in UFOs, Tretyak stated it raised, quote, moderate curiosity, end quote. Echoing the comments of his chief of staff, Maltsev Tretyak further observed, quote, there are real phenomenon of some kind which are appearing before us in the form of UFOs, the nature of which we do not know, end quote. General Tretyak also stated that UFOs had been photographed by interceptor pilots and confirmed on both optical and thermal sensors, but that they sometimes appeared to have stealth-like capabilities to evade radar. Soviet missile bases were also vexed by hovering UFOs that disabled nuclear warheads but did not destroy them in a seemingly determined effort to inform both the US and the Soviets that their weapons would be deactivated if ever deployed. Other reports indicate that Soviet pilots actually flew over UFOs, but did not engage in combat. 
General Tretyak took a page from the U.S. Air Force playbook when he also confirmed that UFOs did not appear to pose a threat, although their origin was unknown. When asked why he had not given the order to open fire on the UFOs, he stated, quote, it would be foolhardy to launch an unprovoked attack against an object that may possess formidable capabilities for retaliation, end quote. Both Russian and American missile defenses experienced ETs closely monitoring and even powering down their nuclear silo facilities ever since the original Trinity test. No overtly hostile actions were taken, but it seemed clear that either superpower would be prevented from actually ever using their nuclear arsenals. Like American military observers, the Soviet Air Force had many instances in which UFOs were seen hovering and then departing at fantastic speeds. Some of the Soviet reports estimated the crafts to be between 100 and 200 meters in diameter, with speeds ranging from hovering motionless to over triple the capacity of modern fighters, with the ability to stop instantaneously. Other reports indicated that the UFOs performed startling maneuverability, yet made no sound. Soviet investigators claimed that UFOs were completely devoid of inertia. In other words, they had somehow come to terms with gravity. At the present time, terrestrial machines can hardly have such capabilities. This means the Soviet scientists believed that the UFOs had perfect anti-gravity capability, which would represent a major technological breakthrough. In the months following the collapse of the Soviet Union, highly classified documents from the KGB became available to the highest bidder, providing UFO researchers a treasure trove of new information. To fly a spacecraft. Just as there are many levels of consciousness among various dimensional beings, there are also many varieties of UFO crafts. Some of them are made of very dense material formations, while others are very etheric less solid in nature. Those that are etheric can be from fourth to fifth dimensional levels. The higher the dimensionality of these ships, the faster they are able to move. Many of them are constructed of light essences or are of etheric physicality and are very similar to a holographic construct yet set in place and able to move at the speed of light. Most UFOs utilize the fourth dimension, which is time. Only third, fourth, and fifth density beings require craft. Entities from sixth density and above can be considered light beings, those at one with the entire universe. These beings are equivalent to or in touch with the entire plane of consciousness in the universe and do not require spacecraft or any material forms for communication and connection. Crafts from the lower dimensions that have been recovered and studied are not what we would expect either. They do not feature bunks, toilets, and leisure lounges as one would expect on a long interstellar voyage. Instead, these UFOs are not machines as we know them, but time travel or interdimensional travel devices. There are smaller scout craft like those recovered at Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, as well as motherships, 
that are larger than an aircraft carrier for the fourth and fifth dimensional beings, the crafts are somehow intelligently steered using an invisible interface between pilot and craft. In other cases, such as the glowing orbs, there is nothing inside and nobody inside either. The orbs, or Foo Fighters, as they were called by Allied pilots during World War II, were not seen so much as a craft, but as a light pulsating with a glow. However, it is thought the orbs need mercury to function. The orbs are commonly seen as creating crop circles, and observers report seeing them being chased away by black helicopters. Both the orbs and UFOs are flown using thought command to guide the aerial devices. In the case of the orbs, it is presumed they are guided by a remote viewing pilot. The thought command system on UFOs is connected directly to the pilots through a sort of electrical nervous system on the craft, which can be controlled by their own minds. The bodies of each crew member are likewise tuned into and connected to the nervous system built into the spacecraft. In fact, the spacecraft is modeled in much the same way as the pilot's body. It is adjusted specifically to the frequency of each crew member. Therefore, the craft can be operated by collective thoughts, that is, the mental energy emitted by the pilot and crew. It is really a very simple, direct control system. Thus, there are no complicated controls or navigation equipment on board the spacecraft. They operate as an extension of the biological bodies and minds of the crew members. The spacecraft is navigated by direct interaction between the electronic waves generated within the minds of the pilots and the craft's directional controls. The electronic brain signals are interpreted and transmitted by the headband devices, which serve as a craft interface along with hand indentation panels. The brainwave control for navigation directs the pilot's thoughts and translates them into an electronic circuit. There is no steering wheel or conventional method of control on the spacecraft, and the headbands are designed to pick up signals from the brain. The sensors on the headbands correspond with points on the multi-lobed brain that generate low frequency waves. So the headbands form an integral part of the circuit. The single piece skin tight coveralls worn tightly by the pilots also play a role. The lengthwise atomic alignment of the fabric also allows the body of the pilots to become part of the electrical storage and generation of the craft itself. It is not just to steer or navigate the vehicle, but the pilots actually become part of the electrical circuitry of the vehicle, vectoring the craft in a way similar to the way we can voluntarily order a muscle to move. The vehicle is simply an extension of their own bodies, because it is tied directly into their neurological systems. This technology is reminiscent of homeopathy. Homeopathic doctors trace the human body down to a channel of light. So when it comes to space travel, it is advisable to know what you're getting into, to consider what kind of potential is out there. With the proper insight and star charts, along with a capable craft and crew, any place in the universe 
is only a moment's thought away. Interdimensional spacecraft would include a tiny cold fusion reactor in the center of a spinning disk whose center is stationary. In one model of how UFOs fly, the outside of the disk somehow is made to rotate at nearly the speed of light, and then everything can scale up to infinite speeds or connections, ascending into the fourth dimension. Basically, the fourth dimension is a realm of pure light, a higher vibrational overtone, a place where one's thoughts can instantly manifest. After making a sharp 90 degree turn, only the pilot and passengers can determine the next destination, arriving as instantaneously as their collective thoughts. Space travel is not necessarily sending a ship from one area to another. It is more like beaming the passengers between ships from one area to another instantaneously. Theoretically, no time is involved. Configs and specs. Space travel in concept is not very difficult. The first task is to create two counter-rotating energy fields at a very specific speed, namely nine-tenths the speed of light. When these conditions are met, similar to Stargate technology, whatever matter exists between these fields will shift up to the next dimensional level, as demonstrated by the U.S. government in the 1943 Philadelphia Experiment. In this top secret experiment, the U.S. Navy attempted to make a battleship invisible with counter rotating fields of energy, but stopped the experiment prematurely and created an interdimensional crash instead. The intense electrical fields created a rip in the fabric of space time before the battleship could be linked to its new destination. What we today would call the ultimate computer can be found aboard back-engineered spacecrafts. Their computers are an electronic device that serves as an artificial brain or a highly complex calculating machine. It is capable of storing information, making computations, solving problems, and performing mechanical functions. Computers in advanced ET societies are extremely advanced. In most of the galactic systems of the universe, very large computers are commonly used to run the routine administration, mechanical services, and maintenance activities of an entire planet or even a planetary system. According to Area 51 whistleblower Bob Lazar, Propulsion of UFOs is achieved by gravity amplifiers, three on its lowest level, independently positioned and used to emit gravitational waves. Lift is gained by gravity wave, where phase shifts the wave in a kind of opposite polarity from the force of the Earth's gravity. Liftoff is performed on one amplifier called Omicron, then transitioned to the Delta configuration, which uses all three amplifiers for space travel. The craft uses these amplifiers to distort space around the craft, so it is always moving downhill into the zone it has created, even when it goes straight up. Most UFO crafts studied by humans have four to six layers. The upper outside layer of solid metal accounts for 25%. The second layer of rubber is 30%. The third layer of metal is also 30%, and the last layer has marked magnetic properties. 
a diffuse layer of electric charges occurs most effectively when the liquid E plasma is moving. And the faster the E plasma moves, the more pronounced will be the separation effect of its electric ions from the ions in the differently moving diffused layer outside. If energy is injected into the magnetic layer, spaceships can fly across the universe. Such a spacecraft would have a double hull construction with several sets of optical fiber windings between the two hulls. One set of windings is used to create a uniform surrounding force field that streamlines the spacecraft. This streamlining allows the craft to move smoothly through space itself. The other sets of windings generate the force fields that are used to propel and guide the craft on its journey. The outer body is injection molded with no seams, cold to the touch, and made of metal. The metallic skin is also used as a translucent viewport. The display panels within UFOs appear as liquid crystal. Let's go flying. The first U.S. Air Force pilots in the late 1950s were trained to fly these highly advanced disks in a simulator. Specifically, the flight simulator taught them how to fly gravity field-driven crafts. The first thing they noticed was that there was no seat belts in the simulator, since there were no seat belts in the actual craft. In fact, pilots or passengers don't need seat belts because in flight, there is no upside down like in a regular aircraft. No one can feel the sensation of being upside down. That's because the craft has its own gravitational field inside. So even if the craft is flying upside down, everyone inside the craft still feels as if they are right side up. Another interesting aspect of these crafts is that there are usually no windows. The only way the pilots have any visibility at all is done with external cameras displayed on screens or relayed to a headband device. These camera relay devices are delivered to the pilots in a mental image picture. After the craft warms up, because the disc has its own gravitational field, some pilots reported that they felt sick or disorientated for about two minutes after getting in. The earlier pilot said it takes a lot of time to become used to this sensation. Because of the very small size of the craft, there is very little room for any movement. To just raise your hand becomes complicated, so you have to be extensively trained in unconventional ways. Pilots receive rigorous mind training to learn to accept what they are seeing in their minds as an actual feeling experience. Just moving about is difficult, but after a while, the pilots get used to the sensation and can become quite adept. The training taught them to become familiar with where everything was located and to expect what was going to happen to their bodies. The early human UFO pilots said it was no different than accepting the G-forces in conventional flights, such as these strange sensations of coming out of a dive. As above, so below. The ET crafts use a universal grid system in traveling from one point of space to another. 
their crafts are able to travel at or near the speed of light, as discussed previously. This enables a craft to go into an altered space-time chamber, which allows the point of departure and the point of destination to shrink drastically in real time. It is similar to folding space, thus making the two points, departure and destination, become much closer, so close as to be virtually identical. Although we have been given the basic blueprint for such a craft, including the propulsion mechanism and overall operating system, our scientists are still working to fully understand and backward engineer the technology. The craft utilizes minerals that we simply don't have here on Earth, such as element 115. One particular element, similar to uranium, but not as radioactive, provides the extra power for the propulsion system. These crafts also utilize a form of space displacement system, which basically causes a vacuum in front of the propulsion that allows nothing to interfere with the created thrust. The technology uses a vacuum chamber, which consists of a mini nuclear reactor that forces some type of matter into space, which deletes the molecules and causes that very small portion of space to become a vacuum. They also utilize antimatter in such a way as to force the propulsion system into streams or waves of energy in front of the craft. This enables it to move and flow much easier through space without any friction from the atmosphere. There may be yet one more way to traverse the expanse of the universe. An ancient meditation practice concerns itself with astral traveling. While in this meditative state, the viewer first travels into the center of the earth. According to the ascended masters, in the middle of our planet, within the core, is a miniature universe. The remote viewer then experiences a shrinking to the point that when getting close to the miniature universe and relative to it, the former miniature universe becomes huge and is the exact same size as the galaxy surrounding the Earth. One must be connected vibrationally to the heart of the Earth, and in this way the astral traveler may both enter and return to the universe via our solar system and finally return to the body externally from above. Russian scientists were the first to postulate the possibility that a navigational craft can also manipulate matter to penetrate the center of the planet, enter the miniature universe, and use this as a technique for instantly connecting to distant stars. Indeed, the Nazis believed in the hollow earth theory where the poles were the entranceways into the interior. Outside and above Earth, they believed the poles could be wormhole gates to the stars and could have been one of the reasons why they set up bases in both of the polar regions.